Welcome to Cardiac Delusions. Let's see our code today. The patient is death neck, so no need now for urgent ECG. Is it true or false? We always think of ECG immediately in any patient presenting with chest pain, whatever it is typical or atypical. But what about patient presenting to the ER or even to the OPD with dyspnea? Do we need urgent ECG? First of all, we need to summarize the causes of dyspnea that we see in our clinical practice. We have cardiovascular causes, pulmonary causes, and metabolic causes. Cardiovascular are like the compensated heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, angina equivalent, tamponade, and pulmonary hypertension. All of those patients can present with dyspnea rather than chest pain. Pulmonary causes like COPD, bronchial asthma, pneumonia, or interstitial lung fibrosis, and metabolic causes like anemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. Let's focus here on the cardiovascular causes. For example, acute myocardial ischemia may present with dyspnea rather than chest pain as part of an angina equivalent because some of the patients with acute coronary syndrome may describe their symptoms as being dyspnea, not chest pain, and sometimes they may be complicated by acute pulmonary edema, which is a medical emergency, and in this case, the patient sure would describe dyspnea because he is severely distressed, and even if he was describing chest pain before it, he may not concentrate with the chest pain because he is severely distressed. Also, the patient with tachyarrhythmia may complain with dyspnea, and sometimes he may deny palpitation because the severe tachycardia may lead to respiratory distress. And patient with spread arrhythmia, sometimes he may describe dyspnea rather than dizziness. So tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias may present with dyspnea. Also, the patient with decompensated heart failure, of course, he would describe dyspnea, and his ECG may show some clues, especially in long-standing cases, that may direct you toward a cardiac etiology rather than pulmonary etiology. So the question now that forces itself upon our minds, what can the ECG show me in a dyspneic patient? I may see ST elevation in the anterior leads, so directing me towards the diagnosis of anterior STEMI and the need for primary PCI urgently, or I can see ST elevation in another territory like in the inferior leads, like lateral lead, I may see features of posterior MI. So here, the patient described dyspnea, but he is having ST elevation, myocardial infarction, and he need urgent revascularization. Also, I can see features that can occur with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome like ST depression in the precordial leads, in the inferior leads. I can see symmetrical T-wave inversion suggestive of myocardial ischemia. So here's the diagnosis of acute myocardial ischemia and the patient didn't mention chest pain. Some of the patients may describe dyspnea rather than palpitation because they have AF with rapid ventricular Rate. So here the patient is complaining of dyspnea either for a long duration or acute dyspnea and by examination you can detect a regular pulse and here the ECG would get you for the diagnosis that the patient is having rapid AF. Patients with supraventricular tachycardia sometimes, especially with elderly, they may describe dyspnea rather than palpitation, and so we need to terminate this SVT urgently, either by medications, or if he is hemodynamically unstable, I will resort to DC shock, or even ventricular tachycardia patients may describe dyspnea, and they may describe dizziness, lightheadedness, and they don't tell you that they have palpitation, so here's the ECG will direct you toward the malignant tachyarrhythmia that need urgent cardioversion. Even patients with 2 to 1 EV block may describe shortness of breath rather than dizziness or lightheadedness, so here's the ECG would get me the clue for the diagnosis. And also patients with third degree EV block with a significant predicardia, they may describe dyspnea and the ECG showing me complete AV dissociation will get me towards the diagnosis. If the patient is describing dyspnea for a long duration and he is having left bundle branch block, it may raise the suspicion of the presence of baseline structural heart disease like ischemic LV dysfunction, like dilated cardiomyopathy, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and so the ECG here may be a clue 
toward the cardiac etiology. Also, the presence of pathological Q wave may raise the suspicion of old myocardial infarction. And so, if this patient is presenting now with dyspnea on exertion, I may suspect the presence of ischemic LV dysfunction just from this tip in the ECG. And one of the famous signs in ECG that is not uncommon to see in our clinical practice is electrical alternance in which we can see alternating variability in the complex amplitude between PET and PET. And this is a sign of massive pericardial infusion in which the heart is swinging inside the large pericardial sac with a large amount of fluid. So this ECG may direct me toward the diagnosis of pericardial effusion that may be causing tamponade for urgent pericardiosynthesis. So we can conclude that the ECG in a dyspneic patient may show me tachyarrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia, may show me features of myocardial ischemia like ST elevation, ST depression, biphasic T wave or T wave inversion, may show me pathological Q waves, left bundle branch block, intraventricular conduction delay, and may show me electrical alternance. All of these features direct me toward the cardiac cause for the dyspnea and so I can formulate my management plan based on the ECG. Did we forget something? Yes, of course, we forgot the pulmonary embolism, which is a common pathology to see in our clinical practice but is usually missed from our differential diagnosis. The ECG would be the first step that helped me to raise the suspicion of pulmonary embolism because it may show me normal features but it can show RV strain pattern. As we can see here, we can see asymmetrical T wave inversion and T depression in the right precordial leads from V1 to V3, sometimes extending to V4. It can show me sinus tachycardia, raising the suspicion in a patient with dyspnea that the patient may have pulmonary embolism. It may show me the famous ECG clue, S1, Q3, T3, which is the presence of S wave in lead one. Q wave in lead 3 and T wave inversion in lead 3 and may show me as well right axis deviation. All of these ECG features may raise the suspicion of presence of pulmonary embolism as a cause of the patient's dyspnea. So what about this famous belief that if the patient presents to the ER with dyspnea and he doesn't describe chest pain, no need now for urgent ECG? It is completely wrong and the presence of dyspnea justifies the need for urgent ECG to exclude some pathologies. For example, acute coronary syndrome including STEMI or non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, tachyarrhythmia, radiarrhythmia, ECG features that may suggest the presence of a structural heart disease as a cause of dyspnea, pulmonary embolism and in some cases it may suggest tamponade. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for the next cardiac delusion.